Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Meet BOA Authors uh, Series. This is a collaboration between BOA Editions and Writers and Books. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the director of adult programs. Writers and Books is a literary arts center in Rochester, New York. And we offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages and backgrounds. You can find more information at our website, wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions through the chat as well. Books are available through our bookstore, Ampersand Books. I'll put the link in the chat. We're so happy to have Erica Meitner with us this evening. First, we'll hear her read. Then she'll be in conversation with Peter Connors, publisher and executive director of BOA Editions. Erica Meitner is the author of six books of poems, including Holy Moly, Carry Me, which is the winner of the 2018 National Jewish Book Award in Poetry and a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, Copia and Ideal Cities, a 2009 National Poetry Series winner. Her poems have been uh, anthologized widely and have appeared in such publications as Plowshares, Virginia Quarterly Review, The New York Times Magazine, The New Republic, and Poetry. Meitner lives in rural uh, southwest Virginia and is currently a professor of English at Virginia Tech. In her new collection, Useful Junk, Meitner explores memory, passion, and the various ways the body sees and is seen. Boldly asserting that pleasure is a vital form of knowledge, Useful Junk reminds us that ourselves are made real and beautiful by our embodied experiences, and that our desire is what keeps us alive. Erica, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Dan, and thanks to Writers and Books for hosting me and Ampersand Books for selling books for the reading. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read some poems um, from Useful Junk, um, which may or may not appear backwards on your screen. But um, this is my third book with BOA, and I'm really pleased to be slightly early launching it um, through an organization in Rochester, which is where BOA is based out of. Um, so I'm going to start by reading a poem that's kind of long. Um, but it's called Letter to Hillary on the Radical Hospitality of the Body. And a lot of the poems in this book are letters to a millennial named Hillary who actually exists, who's a real human. Um, I've taken over the BOA Instagram for the week, and I'm going to be posting an actual picture of us together. I got to see her in Seattle this weekend. Um, and we started corresponding in 2017 in poem letters back and forth on Facebook Messenger and different um, texting platforms. And these poems are actual letters that I wrote to her. And this one takes place um, at an artist residency in Virginia. Letter to Hillary on the radical hospitality of the body. I want to tell you something about the body, though I'm not sure how to articulate it exactly. I've been trying all morning to write a meditation on the sensory, on touch, delineate between kinesthetic and haptic, and instead I am staring at the white hard-boiled egg I took from breakfast, rolled on its side on my white desk. Instead, I am fielding texts from my sister, who had a baby last week, and says she has uncontrollable chills and wonders if this is normal hormonal postpartum stuff or what. I don't know the answer, so I tell her to call her doctor in case it's an infection, because it's Sunday, and I'm at an artist colony with period cramps and a slight hangover, since last night a painter opened the massive barn where they keep sculptures in process, put some beer on ice, rigged up his phone, and threw a dance party where we did our best to lose ourselves in darkness and summer and Saturday night. Kendrick Lamar and Nicki Minaj, Kanye, and even Aretha, until our bodies stopped thinking of themselves at all, and we were only movement, limbs pressing through air, helicopters, drummers, wind-up contraptions, turbine engines, until we were all sweating profusely, taking turns standing in front of the lone fan, flapping our shirts up and out to let the generated wind cool skin we'd normally keep covered up. Outside the doors, split open to the rafters, there were fireflies pulsing mating codes, 
stars pushing forward their fused light, clouds trailing their dust across the face of the moon. Like them, we leave traces behind of hair and skin, accumulations of bodily excess donated back to the earth, a measure of time and breath, like spit and blood and cum and piss. I have let so many things and people enter and sometimes inhabit my body for lengths of time. They're uncountable. And I'm sure you have too, despite the fact that the world tells us as women to stay vigilant and shut. This is not about void or gap or hole, what's missing or punched through or needs filling. Yesterday on the way here, I passed two storefronts in the same strip mall, big boys, guns, and ammo next to Serenity Counseling Center. And then near the sheets, a hiker walking the shoulder of 460, carrying a giant wooden cross that was at least half the size of himself. This is where I'd insert something about violence and mindfulness, grace and perhaps suffering, but who knows why anyone carries anything around until it gets so heavy we set it down. Hillary, this isn't working. I don't know any more about the body than I did to begin with, except that I was surprised I still remember how to dance with abandon. It had been years. We carry our movements, muscle memory, scars of all kinds, inscribed on our skin, and inside us a space-time continuum that contains all the people and places we've touched and tasted and walked through and dwelled in. And as soon as we move through them, they change and vanish. So I will open myself up again and again. What I'm trying to say in this small body of a poem is that our bodies themselves are without regrets, persistent, and mortal and relentless. So I picked out a bunch of poems that are really different from one another. Um, this next one I'm going to read is called Bureau, Bureau of Reclamation. And the Bureau of Reclamation is actually um, part of the Department of Interior that's in charge of water rights. Um, and I guess the only two things that you need to know about this poem is that some of my family history comes into it. Um, it, uh, it talks about the fact that my grandmother was, my grandmother was in Auschwitz and was um, pressed into work as a slave laborer in a munitions factory for Germany. Um, and also that I am the child of refugees. So this poem talks about that baggage a little bit. Um, it has a cameo by Louise Bourgeois, who's a sculptor, um, and it was inspired actually by my neighborhood Facebook page, where there's like a heavy group of uh, neighborhood bear watchers. Um, we have a neighborhood bear named Boo Boo. So, the Bureau of Reclamation. We, the loyal companions. We who are hyped about everything. We who cross the thresholds of accountability. Our songs of praise sound like gunshots. We, the supermarket shoppers. We, the leggings as pants wearers. We, the shade throwers, the riven in nostalgia itinerants, who avoid our mail at all costs, who remember all our exes unequivocally. We, the hypervigilant. We, who collect regular explanation of benefits. We, who worry about food security. We, the invasive species, we who dwell mostly in the body, we who buried our long suffering ancestors. What would you like to cup in your hands again? Water, a flame? We, the doom scrollers, we who own wildlife patrol cameras, we, the rendered who keep rendering. Louise Bourgeois once said, I can express myself only in a desperate fighting position. We who want approval or adoration. We who see photographs as contraband. The neighbor captures a bear on film ambling through his yard. He warns the rest of us by posting the video on Facebook. We who see photographs as gestures. We the night texters. We who see photographs as certificates of presence. My grandmother received reparations from the German government. 
This was for performing slave labor during the war. We who believe God is not a consuming fire. Blessed is the spectrum. I am paying attention. We the delicate are empty. We the toughened and leathery. We who are bound with floss to anything proximate. We the fruit skins stitched back together after they've been peeled down. We who know the difference between chemistry and alchemy. My children's expired passports. The dream about the boat. We who gather the exiles. It's so strange not being able to see a crowd. I'm kind of reading to myself in my office. Um, this one is a poem that references, oh, thank you, Lamar, for putting something in the chat. Um, this next poem is, is a poem that references the uh, TV show Highway to Heaven, which if you grew up in the 70s and 80s, um, you might be familiar with. Um, and so it starred Michael Landon and Victor French, who both of whom you might remember from Little House on the Prairie, if you are of my vintage era. Um, and so uh, this uses that as a little bit of a metaphor. A Temple of the Spirit. Let's say you are on a plane, and before the plane rises to clear congregations of treetops and blue-gray mountains, you watch the woman who called you up by zone number, then scanned your ticket. You watch her from your plane seat don a knit cap and head out to the runway to wave your plane from the gate with two bright orange batons, her arms held in an uppercase L as our plane taxis past her and her fluorescent green safety vest to rise quickly over the tiny houses and iced over cattle ponds of the Eastern shore. Let's say that now you are on that plane, thrusting itself deep into clouds, which enshroud everything for a moment in a dense halo of whiteness that is not fog. The kind of bright cloudiness you'd expect from the transition to a movie's dream sequence or the opening to an episode of Highway to Heaven with Michael Landon right before he walks down that deserted canyon road, duffel bag in hand, then hops in a baby blue 1977 Ford when Victor French pulls over for him. In the show, Landon is actually an angel stripped of his wings. He and French, a retired cop, are given assignments by the boss to help troubled humans overcome their problems. What I'm saying is sometimes we are asked to arrive in a new city and assume the identities of business employees or civil service workers for the greater good. Or sometimes we are forced to hold out our arms like cheerleaders for a team we don't believe in, as if our bodies can influence the score no matter what we are thinking. But what if the team is humanity? I don't know if there's a God, but sometimes we are asked to carry a baton for long periods of time as if we're in a relay and can hand it off to the next person waiting, usually somewhere other than the place we began, though that action is so tricky and fails often. I hope the gate woman was L for team liftoff or levity or love of the human race. Luck for our tin can with twin engines, newly cleared of snow. Let's say yes. I'm just going to read two more, um, and they're they're pretty short as far as my poems go. Um, this one is a more lyric poem, um, and it is hard to talk about, I think, because of that. So I'm just going to read it. Um, the practice of depicting matter as it passes from radiance to decomposition. Last night I saw horses in a gated pasture at dusk. It was still over a hundred degrees, though it was darkening. We live in public. When we pass next to water, it glitters with movement and light. This can induce melancholy. I revisit all the bits of my past I can't shake but it's not nostalgia, just the porous borders of summer. I was walking, I was slick with sweat, then gritty with salt. We think we have many homes, 
but our only home is the body, these space-time machines, these sculptures of fluid and rind and scaffolding, of breath and membrane and pleasure. How far can your arm reach when you stretch it in front of you? This is the theory of the very near. We are like turntables, delicate stylus, coaxing sound from a rotating body, sometimes the same song on repeat for years. This is what it means to get into the groove, rivers of stitch and valleys of bone. Sometimes the bodies are those of others, or sometimes our own. Lately, I think more about where I'd like my body to rest. What I'm saying is we are all in this together, this accrual of scars, this palace of objects. What I'm saying is grab, grasp something tightly, then let it drop. We slough off everything, starting with our hair and skin, which becomes dust, an index of time and accumulation. Sorry for my tiny stumbles. This is like it's made, this book's made in voyage. So I'm just getting used to reading it. Um, I'm going to end with this poem that's for my friend Danielle, who helped me edit this book and put it together. Um, we were both talking about our 20s in New York, and we realized we both used to go to the same bar, but not at the same time. Um, and so this poem is, is for her. We used to go to the Bulgarian bar, but not together. The place on Broadway and Canal, whose motto was helping ugly people have sex since 416 BC. And it probably had another name, but everyone only knew it as the Bulgarian bar, where Gogol Bordello frontman Eugene Hutz, who is sexy in that sweaty limber way, like Mick Jagger, but much skeezier and with a thick Ukrainian accent, DJ gypsy music. And we figured this out somehow while reminiscing about our 20s in New York City via text. And our 20s in the city were PowerPoint temp jobs, were stealing rolls of toilet paper from restaurant bathrooms, were pagers and flip phones and pay phones, were July subway platform infernos, were whiffs of hot copper and pee and trash, were walk up cockroaches, were dive bar makeout sessions, were chain smoking on fire escapes, and unspecified parades rolling past tall office windows, were brick facade or window casements falling to the sidewalk and shattering at our feet, were illegal sublets and late rent checks, and spit shined heartbreak when nothing and nobody depended on us. And she said, did I tell you I headbutted a girl in the face there one night dancing? Not on purpose, but still. Thank you. And I think Peter's going to pop in now like the like the sort of head of Michael Landon or Victor French. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me OK? Yep, you're good. All right, that was excellent. Thank you so much, Erica. What a treat to hear those after reading them so many times. And it's really cool to hear them in your voice. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, a, a lot of times the first impression that somebody has of a book, uh, a browser, let's say, is the, the image on the front, but it's certainly the title too. And so I'm curious what the title Useful Junk means to you, especially in relation to this book. So the title actually, I lately I've had the titles for my books like at the very beginning of writing them. And with this book too, I started all the poems with the titles. I never wrote a poem first and put the title on second. I always had a list of titles and mm. tried and, and would always start with the titles and write the poem. But I, pa I was in rural Ohio um, because my in-laws live there near Oberlin on Route 50. Um, and there was an antique store that was called Useful Junk with this like hand painted sign. Um, and there was something pleasing to me about the phrase. But as I started writing this book, it took on a sort of like kind of it felt like it took on a, many meanings. Um, some of the, the book, like many of my poems, I think this book is like jammed with a whole bunch of stuff. Um, like I'm a poetic maximalist. And so I feel like my poems are like a junk shop equivalent in some way. Like if you can think of it, I probably have put it in a poem. 
Um, the second piece is this book has a lot to do with technology and um, desire through technology. And obviously junk is like a euphemism for male genitalia, which I felt like spoke to parts of the book too. Um, but also I think the technology itself, which in some ways um, is a way that we live now, but is also like really problematic in the way that we live now in certain ways. So I think it speaks to that piece too, but mostly it was the junk shop sign. That's, that's great. Um, so I, you just said something really interesting, was, which was, you know, many things, but one of the things that stood out to me is if you can think of it, I probably put it in a poem. And it just occurs to me, that, so this is your sixth book, it's your third BOA book. And I'm curious, you know, because you put in, because you're a maximalist, because you put so much into every poem, you know, with this sixth book, is there stuff in there that you really, is this sort of the first time addressing? Or are you looking at sort of similar topics and different lights as time moves on? That's a great question. I, I think um, I've always written about the female body and women's sexuality for year, I mean, probably 20 years at this point. Um, I think the difference between useful junk in my last book, Boa did, Holy Moly Carry Me, is that Holy Moly Carry Me, even though it was about both intimate and public subjects, it felt like a, a public facing book. Um, useful junk, I really wrote for myself. I wasn't even sure I would send it out to be published. It felt like a very personal book to me. Um, and, and one I really wrote not thinking of so much about audience other than Hillary, who I was writing to at the time. Um, I just wanted to make poems that spoke to me personally. And so um, I think to me, that's the difference with this book. I really like, it's the first one I wrote only for me. And if it resonates for people, I'm really excited about that. Um, but I feel like I wrote it in a little bit of a, a bubble. We're all familiar with these bubbles at this moment. <laughs> and it was pre-pandemic. I wrote it pre-pandemic. Oh, right. um, but I wrote a lot of it at artist residencies where I was um, in community in the evenings, but during the day very much by myself, which isn't my normal life. Right, right. Um, so you, in, again, you said something just then about um, public facing book with um, with your last book. And so I would love to talk to you just a little bit about documentary poetry, which is something you, you sort of specialized in or that appears in a lot of your work. And maybe you could just, you know, in general, tell, let people know, you know, what that term even means and then why you feel it's valuable, why that's a form that you go to. So I kind of write almost two kinds of poetry or in my head, I think of it as sort of bifurcated. Um, one is the more personal stuff that appears in my books. But there's also what I call documentary poetry in my books. So some of the poems in Useful Junk come out of a long-term project I've been working on for the last five years in Miami on sea level rise and architecture. Um, and so with projects like that, I actually go on the road and do field work with photographers. And so in this case, I've been working with one photographer, Anna Maria Berry Jester, who's also a public health journalist. Um, where we take joint trips to Miami and actually like photograph and interview people and use what we see um, and what we hear and what we experience and what we record. Um, I use all of those materials to make poems. Um, so there's a few poems in Useful Junk from my Miami project. My book Copia, which was my first book with Boa, had a lot from a project I did on Detroit during bankruptcy on commission for Virginia Quarterly Review. So often I'll work for magazines on commission, like a journalist. And Holy Moly Carry Me um, had some poems that I did for um, also VQR on Cleveland during the Republican National Convention. So those projects are integrated into my more personal work too, because of my positionality as a speaker. Like I'm usually, unless it's a completely third person poem in a recorded voice of someone else, I'm usually in those poems um, in some way. There's a lot of um, technology in this too, sort of the way that we interface with technology, the way we perceive the world through technology and perceive each other and relationships and so forth. And that seems, you know, I, I think you've addressed it before, but that that's really seems to be a pretty big focus in this collection. So I'm curious how you came to, the, to that, to technology as a topic for this. Yeah, that's a great question. So the book actually started to some extent 
when I was sitting in the Food Lion parking lot. <laughs> and one of the things, because, you know, I live in rural Appalachia. So like uh, the places I go are not glamorous. Um, <laughs> but everyone sat in their supermarket parking lot in their car in the dark. And one of the things I was noticing was how many people were sitting in their cars and their faces were lit blue by the glow of their phones. Um, and there was something about that to me, all these people like sitting in their cars, either like, I don't know what everybody was doing. Maybe they were doom scrolling. Maybe they were communicating with other people um, or just like having a moment. But there was something about the way everyone is is lit up that way that was really striking to me. Um, and while I was corresponding with Hillary, um, I started writing this book in, in 2016, some of the earlier poems, and some of this technology was new. And as a Gen X person, Hillary was teaching me how to use some of it, um, like how to take a selfie. You know, like you talk to anyone over 40, mm -hmm. like we're not really experts in the field or other things that, that you know, I think my kids are much more fluent in than I am, like YouTube or TikTok. You know, my son's monetized his TikTok. I can't even get on there. The interface is so confusing and I'm not a technophobe. Um, and so I was really interested in, in um, photography specifically as a medium that we use online in this book and, and what it means to see yourself. And for me in particular, this was interesting as a woman who's kind of in middle age because um you know, the, the, the thing that people tell you is, you know, as women hit middle age, we become invisible. But my experience was kind of the opposite, that with all of this social media, we're just becoming more and more public. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was really interested in, in that tension, in what it means to be seen, what it means to see others, what it means to connect with others. And one of the things I noticed about you know, poems in the last five years is so few of them actually address the technology that we use. The poems I was seeing the most that do this were from my um, gay male students who were writing all these grinder poems um, and other poems that were using dating apps in them that were appearing um, that were appearing in in their work. And I wanted that to be more in my work because it seemed like such a big part of our lives that we were ironing out of our poems in general. And I say, we just like poets, you know? I'm curious, what um, what do you see sort of, you know, looking into the future for the role of technology and just getting poems to people? Or let me ask that a different way too. Like, do you think it will impact the, the shape, the presentation of poems, the way people write poems? I mean, I think it already has in that my students are, you know, I've been teaching almost 25 years at this point feel ancient when I say that, but I don't feel like I am ancient. Um, but they're much more attuned to visual imagery in certain ways. I'm not an alarmist. Like I'm not one of those people who's like, Instagram is killing poetry. Um, but it is true that my students find the poems they want to read more and more, not in the library. They find them on Instagram. Um, and so I like to send them to sites like Poetry is Not a Luxury or other sites on Instagram that are posting, um, you know, whole long, longer po actual poems from books. Mm -hmm. So I think the medium can be used many ways. You know, there's like the Rupi Kaur model, which is more epigrammatic and shorter and includes drawings often. Um, and then there's just the dissemination of more traditional poems. But I, I do think um, the internet is allowing for more um, multivalent work too, you know, audio, video, all of these things that can enhance the poetic experience. So I feel like I'm not an alarmist about technology, but I do think um, one of the things I try to talk to my students about a lot is developing a reading practice and how do you do that? And that's something I have to teach now, whereas in past years I never did. Um, mm. Yeah. And why do you think that is? Just because even, I mean, like I think about my first workshops, right? I did my MFA in 1999 before the internet really, like before we could look up stuff. So the information we were limited to in our poems was whatever we could find in the encyclopedia in the library. Like if you didn't know what that flower was called, you had no app for that. Right. Um, and so uh, Greg Orr, who was one of my first teachers, gave us extra credit for buying a Peterson's field guide. Um but we have access to so much more stuff we can jam into our poems or put in because it's really easy to look it up. 
Um, but it also means that my students, you know, we don't go to the library as much anymore. We don't browse the stacks. We don't like have that like amazing, like desiccated book smell wafting over us. And so I think um, helping my students find presses they like or poets they like, and then finding, you know, we'd recommend books to each other all the time. And I think now people do that on the internet a little bit more. Um, but but reminding people that you can read um, if you really like something a press publishes, for example, like if you like my work, you'll probably like Kendra DeColo's work or Camille Guthrie's work, who are also both my BOA press mates, um, or some of the other books that are like Danny Quintus's book that's coming out um, are all good fits. And so it's like that, almost that Amazon algorithm, but teaching people to do it a little bit more um, analog is what I mean by reading practice, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's cool. And obviously, you know, from the small press perspective, um, poetry press perspective, that's that's great because it's also letting people know like that concept of, you know, if you like this, then you might like this just even on the, on the press's website. Um, so I'm curious if there's any book or poet, and I asked this also knowing that you just came from AWP where you probably left like everybody with a huge stack full of new books and, and met all kinds of people and got them signed and all that. Is there any um, particular book or poet or, or multiples that you're reading right now that you're particularly excited about? I just finished a bunch of books because I flew to Seattle and back and I had like a lot of unbroken time on the plane. Um, and so I just finished um, Mark Wonderlich's uh, new book, which is terrific. Um, and I'm, I'm so, there was this great SNL skit. My brain is broke. It was like a game show about how broken everybody's brain is from COVID on, on Saturday night. And I feel like it was three people trying to figure out what a wheelbarrow is called. And I feel like when people <laughs> ask me this question, like that's me, I'm like, Whoa. Um, Pat Rosal's new and, um, new and selected is fantastic. Um, he's someone who I've been reading since the early days, um, that's out from Persia. Um, See by Barbara Fisher, BK Fisher, is a book I keep coming back to that Boa published. It's about um, a woman who is rescued by her UPS man during an apocalyptic flood that basically wipes out the earth and ends up on a container ship on the way to Greenland. Um, and it sounds really strange, but it's amazing. Um what is another book that I just read that I thought was great? Um, Donica Kelly's new book um, devastated me. I was sobbing on the plane. Um, don't recommend it for plane reading, but for home reading, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but there's so many good books um, out or coming out um, that I'm really excited for. I actually just read with uh, Philip B. Williams in Seattle and was reading his book Mutiny on the plane on the way back, which is fantastic also. Um, so there's a ton of really great stuff out right now. And I guess this goes back to a little bit to the documentary poem um, question. I'm curious, is there anything that you're working on now in that vein or anything that you sort of have your eye on as a subject? I've been writing a bunch of stuff about climate change and sea level rise that are um, a lot of it deals with endangered species and somehow the Holocaust has been wending its way into all of it. And so mm -hmm. I feel like almost um, the poem I read, Bureau of Reclamation, might be one of those poems that um, I always feel like there's one poem in a book that that maybe is a, for, a forebearer to the next book. And that one to me feels like it's the it was like the scout I sent ahead that end up in this book, but is sort of more along the lines of what I'm doing right now in the project I'm working on, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. And I feel like um, you've read enough of my work that you can, that you know what I'm talking about a little bit. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, all right, well, I'm going to um, bow out. If you would read one more poem to close us out, that would be wonderful. It's so good having you here. Thanks for doing this. Thank you, Peter. All right. It was lovely to see you. Nice to see you too. So I'm going to take us out um, on a, another Hillary poem, and this one's called Letter on Gratitude. Um, yeah. And thank you to everybody who um, put stuff in the chat. It's fun to see your notes. Letter on Gratitude. Hillary, it's the night after Thanksgiving and everyone is asleep. 
I'm in the living room of my childhood home. My father has installed a timer that turns lights on automatically. The timer sounds like a fuse to a homemade bomb. My Chilean aunt made flan and brazo de reina for second Thanksgiving. An ex posts a shirtless photo of himself by a window. I wondered if he had a Thanksgiving at all, the way the sunlight cut across his body. My sons were piled on their cousins watching Teen Titans go. My uncle is dying slowly. My sister's baby, we passed her around like a potato. When she cried, we bounced from the knees. When she cried, my mother made jokes about putting her up for adoption, told one cousin to have another child, told the other about my sister's 23 frozen eggs, forgot my cousins are infertile, forgot my son is adopted. I ate fruit and brownie pie and flan and brazo de reina. I helped clear the table. I listened to my mother's cousin talk about the war. She told us about a man with two dachshunds on the train with Uncle Jack to the refugee camp at Bergen-Belsen. She was an orphan by then. The opera singer that met us at the Port Authority, she said. Her nails were manicured and I was so impressed. The stupid things you remember, she said. My sister made us go around to announce our gratitudes and I felt impossibly empty. I felt very still. I wanted to say, I had dim sum, I saw exhibits, I wandered the strangely deserted streets of Soho at night. I said, my family, but what I meant was my desire. When I was younger, I thought I could return indefinitely, turn toward the body of the city, always slightly unchanged somehow, and waiting for me. Late afternoon shadows splayed on the faces of buildings. In that golden light and traffic, nothing needing me, my gratitude or praise. Thank you everyone for joining me on this Crowdcast screen. And I hope everyone has a good night. Thank you so much, Erica. That was, that was wonderful. Uh, I want to thank uh, Peter Connors for joining us. Uh, buy the book. The link is in the chat. Uh, you can find uh, all of our programming at wab.org. Uh, and I hope you join us next week for Danny Kintos is reading. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you.